So now uh, I'd like to invite uh, Osprey up to the stage. And she's an old, dear friend, Art alumni. Um, first showed up, I think, around 2009-10. A wonderful artist, but also a leader um, in the issues of the, uh, <clears throat> the movement that we're talking about, and particularly focusing on, on the uh, South American and, um, and the uh, issues uh, concerning Amazonia and indigenous peoples uh, all over the planet. So here you go. Thank you so much, Chip. Good morning, everyone. These are all the diehards that are still here early in the morning. So yes, my name is Osprey Oreo Lake, and I'm the executive director of the Women's Earth and Climate Action Network, We Can. And I'm honored today on Indigenous Peoples Day to be here on the traditional territories and ancestral homelands of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, Ute, and other Native American nations. Um, and I want to thank Chip. I don't know where you went over there. Uh, maybe he walked out. Um, I want to thank Chip for bringing us all together and to really honor him. And maybe we could give him an applause. <clears throat> and um, I'm going to show a video right now to share some of our work. But before I do, um, I also think it's really important since it's Indigenous Peoples Day, we have this incredible presentation by Sheila that land acknowledgement is super important, but also I think she pointed out really well action. And I'd like to pledge $1,000 to your organization right now um, to support you. Um, and thank you for your powerful presentation and words and work. Uh, so with that, I'm going to just give you a little taste of some of the work we do at WeCan with um, this video that they've left me to maybe figure out how to do. Just click this. Yes. Okay. The future great-grandmas have a way of being that is balanced, that remembers our relationship to our Mother Earth, our Father Sky, and to all that is. Frontline women and global advocates are building critical strategies for national and international divestment from harmful extractive industries, while also calling for justice and accountability from financial institutions and governments. 60 of the largest banks in the world have put $4.6 trillion into fossil fuel financing since the adoption of the Paris Climate Agreement, and a report by the UN Environment Program found that governments still plan to produce more than double the amount of fossil fuels in 2030 than what would be consistent with limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees. We're asking, where is the government regulation? Where are the political leaders standing up to the fossil fuel industry? And where are the real commitments from governments and financial institutions to phase out fossil fuels and instead invest in a just transition. Colonization divided us, create borders, and violate our lands and bodies. Indigenous women fell and suffered the most because we are in the front lines of the protection of our lands and the protection of our people. Stop dividing us in regions, stop dividing us in borders. If we really want to save the planet, we need all the women uh, from all the regions to discuss and create uh, plans for a better future. We're talking about giving consent to our own bodies as women, but also when it comes to our land, we need to give our consent if someone is going to enter our territory. And that has not been given in so many cases, in so many cases across the Amazon, and this is why these violations are happening to women and to indigenous people in the Amazon. They are taking our rights. They are taking women rights. We are taking people rights, community rights, mother earth rights. Let's build it together. Let's help women, community on the ground, local community, indigenous community.
In our territory, they are killing the air, they're killing the water, they're killing the earth, they're killing the forelegs, they're killing the fins, and they're doing it with their poisons that they amplify because those are natural things, part of natural law that belong inside our mother, the earth. The oil and the gas and those emissions that they put out there are not part of the natural laws, ways of being. They're not part of mother earth's plans. We have within our understanding the natural laws, the natural ways. É preciso garantir a participação das mulheres e da juventude nos espaços de decisão. Aqui no âmbito da COP, a presença e a participação das mulheres ainda é muito invisibilizada. E se nós indígenas, povos indígenas, comunidades tradicionais, estamos apresentando a maior parte da proteção da biodiversidade, nós precisamos estar também como parte da solução. As women, our roles are to take care of our communities. We are not trying to have power over. When we talk about matriarchs, we are talking about those that care for all of us, that bring forward our children, raise our future generations, care for the land. It's time to build a new economy that is within the caring capacity of nature and respects human indigenous rights. And this is what we're really calling for, is that we need a systemic analysis and a systemic change. No climate justice without human rights. 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 Chip, you weren't here, but we gave you applause. <laughs> Okay, just wanted to thank you for bringing us together. Okay, um, go ahead. I'm terrible at technology. I can do other things, but not this. Will it start running by itself? Okay. So I have one of those slideshows that's supposed to run on its own, so I can just talk. And so you'll see some of our work. It's working, yes. So that's going to go on and just share some of the work of women in our network <clears throat> and um, some of the projects that we're doing. What I wanted to talk about today um, is really how we need to disrupt business as usual and understand that we are at this choice point. I don't need to tell everyone in this room why we've been talking about it for days. Most of us are living it every day in the work that we do. Um, but what I want to talk about that there is so much instability in the system right now that it's actually a time where new ways of thinking, visioning, and being can actually have a considerable impact. Um, ideas and policies that might have seemed too radical before actually have an opportunity. So I was really inspired by Sheila's talk because a lot of our young people, and of course indigenous leaders have been saying this for a long time, and women's movements about really where we need to go. And we need to really expand our framework at this point. <clears throat> And I think it's really important to understand that the pressure and insight of global people's movements are actually central to pushing forward transformative and bold leadership right now. Especially, this is especially true because we do not have the politics in place to get to where we need to go. I've been, this is gonna be COP28. I don't think I need to say more. We're not going in the right direction because the politics are not in place. That means something else has to happen. And that's coming from everyone in this room and many other spaces. If we're going to look at the situation, we have to look at it intersectionally with interlocking crises being connected and a historical analysis. Um, and at the heart of our work at WeCan, since its inception, we have been addressing the root causes of this poly crisis, which are based on patriarchy, colonization, racism, and capitalism. And we have to call that out or we're just going to continue these systems. We have to get to the root of it. Mother Earth is demanding it. People's movements are demanding, demanding it and frontline communities are demanding it. And how we're answering that call to systemic root causes and those changes is uplifting four key pillars the rights of indigenous peoples, the rights of women, 
the rights of nature, and the rights of future generations. These are the voices that have been oppressed and missing, and these are the voices that are gonna bring balance back to our communities and the earth. And we have to especially draw upon the knowledge and leadership of indigenous and frontline women who are already deeply engaged in solutions. Um, at We Can and with many other movement leaders, we're calling for urgent action within a climate justice framework. I don't have time to go through exactly what that is, but if you don't understand the justice part of this climate movement, I really suggest you look into it because yes, it's absolutely about centering nature and Mother Earth, but it's also about the people because when we leave the people out, then we're not really caring for all of nature and we need to remember who's being impacted first and worst. I was in New York City, maybe some of you were, just a few weeks ago during the UN General Assembly and the Climate Ambition Summit, which is really the last time governments are gonna meet before COP28. Um, we set forth our own call to action. I was very glad for the Climate Ambition Summit, but let's face it, there needs to be a lot more ambition. I was really happy with the UN Secretary General. I think he's doing a terrific job. I wish governments were really listening to him. I was super glad, I will say one big victory, and I think it's because of our movements, that countries that were the biggest polluters, including the United States, China, Australia, and others were sidelined. They were not given the microphone because they had not met commitments that were, that were demanded by the UN Secretary General. Um, so I do think our movements are having an impact. We set forth our own goals, speaking out in recognition of the sacred interdependence of all life on earth, and with the knowledge that business as usual, with this extractive economic model, predicated on fossil fuel extraction and deforestation, has ushered, ushered in an era of planetary dis, uh, destruction. And I wanna talk just for a, section about, uh, a section, se second about extraction, because, you know, we're looking at the fact that we need to get off of fossil fuels, which is absolutely essential, but we can't just slip into the same economic framework and extractive economy that we've been in, or now we're just going to be mining for minerals for the same business as usual and lifestyle that we have. It's impossible for us to do this. It's not going to change at the paradigm level that we really need to. And a lot of those minerals are also under indigenous lands. So that's not really a solution. Of course we want renewable energy. How are we going to do it? How much of it are we going to do? Who's seated at the table? We really need to think about this. What is our lifestyle? It's much bigger than just getting off of fossil fuels, but that's where we need to begin. We're calling on governments and financial institutions at COP28 and beyond to stay at the 1.5 degree global warming limit. This is an absolute demand. And very specifically, um, you know, a lot of our movements are really looking at this COP to demand a fossil fuel phase out. It's amazing how much negotiations and talks and different pledges are being made every year, but no one wants to do the thing. And the thing is, no more fossil fuel expansion. And that's the demand we have to have. So um, I, wanna, I wanna point out um, a few highlights from our collective demands. That have been going on for a while, but since I've just come from Climate Week, just to share some key points that have not been brought up so much in the discussion so far. Um, and also to say, I think one of the things that is beautiful about what CHIP does at our day is we have all these different perspectives. And to me, there's not one solution. We are an ecosystem. We're like nature. I'm taking care of my corner of the world. Some of you are doing things in other areas around keeping uh, um, carbon in the ground through farming. All these different things are ecosystems. We're working together. There's not a solution. There's an ecosystem of solutions. Um, Weekend's on the steering committee of an initiative to phase out fossil fuels and fast track climate solutions through the fossil fuel nuclear, excuse me, fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty, which was based on the nuclear non-proliferation treaty. It's chaired by an amazing woman leader, Zipporah Berman. So I'm also gonna be highlighting some women leaders as we're going along here. And we need to complement the Paris Climate Agreement with the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. We of course support uh, the Paris Agreement, it was critical, it was huge, but it's not enough. Uh, the Paris Agreement does not mention fossil fuels, 
and they have not been able, countries through that agreement have not been able to constrain supply, this is very important, the supply end through current, um, the commitments that are there. We're heading towards basically a three degree C world by 2100. That's completely unacceptable. We're barely making it as it is over a little bit over one degree rise. The production gap report says supply is 120 percent greater than 1.5 C budget by 2030. I mean, these are impossible numbers. We can't accept them. A block of Pacific nations spearheaded by Vanuatu and Tavula have called on nation states to join them in developing a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. Um, and they have been supported by the World Health Organization, the European Parliament, and thousands of others. And you can look it up online. It's a really big, um, initiative that is growing tremendous amounts of momentum. And so I wanted to highlight that because basically we need a system to get us off of fossil fuels and governments need to figure out a treaty where that is the focus, stop the supply. Um, I also want to, shifting here now, to take note of something else that was brought up at Climate Week that I think is important uh, intervention for all, us to, all of us to consider. Um, we can, and the Global Alliance for Rights of Nature, which we are core members of, I'm on the um, executive committee, called on the United Nations to adopt the Universal Declaration on the Rights of Nature, on the Rights of Mother Earth. It has long been needed, and now is the time. And as I mentioned earlier, some of these ideas, people thought we were crazy 10 years ago, not anymore. The United Nations has adopted the Universal Declaration on Human Rights and on the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, which are critical. We use them in our advocacy work all of the time. I'm thankful for them. But alongside these declarations and principles, it's vital that the United, that United Nations also adopt a Universal Declaration that focuses on nature. Let's get Mother Earth into the center of the conversation here. We're living in a time in which we really have to change everything about how we're living with Mother Earth and each other. And I think rights of nature is one of the frameworks that can help us. The urgency of the climate and ecological crises demand that we completely redesign our economic, social, and legal systems. And this means also looking at like Bhutan, who as we know has the gross national happiness versus GDP as an indicator. This is what I'm talking about, these deep systemic approaches that we have to start talking about. And believe me, I work in an organization where every day we are very practical. We are reforesting. We're protecting land defenders. We are going to do, we do um, meetings with banks to get them to stop funding fossil fuel projects. We go do, doing direct actions. I've been uh, arrested many times. I mean, it's not that we don't know we have to do these very direct put out the fire activities every day, but we also have to simultaneously understand we have to look at what are these systemic frameworks that are really going to be long-term solutions. Um, at the heart of it, with rights of nature, we're asking how can we transform our dysfunctional environmental laws and neoliberal economic systems that are destroying people and planet. And I do want to acknowledge that much of the vision and worldview of rights of nature comes from indigenous peoples around the world and they're deep knowledge of the natural laws of the earth. So even though this is a new and rising movement, it really has its foundations in indigenous people's worldview. So after decades of environmental protection laws, which have of course accomplished a lot for us, they still haven't been able to prevent the increasing grave threats of global warming, degradation of earth's sacred systems of life, and the displacement and death of humans and other species. So the current uh, legal systems we have in relationship to nature are not working. Um, to truly live sustainably and live in harmony with the earth and each other, we actually have to change the very DNA of our legal frameworks to respect the natural laws of our earth. Because right now, most of the frameworks are based on property, seeing nature as property, as ownership. Our life-giving rivers, forests, and mountains are treated as property to be sold and consumed. And so they're not recognized, all of these sacred living systems, um, in, in the court of law. So this is a huge problem. And by maintaining this system, we are really furthering a dangerous human relationship to the natural world uh, of ownership and exploitation. 
an essential step in achieving this change of um, Earth jurisprudence, in essence, is to fundamentally see how nature can be a rights-bearing entity. So how do we sort of move from this idea that nature is sacred and our sacred life system into our current legal frameworks? Well, this is one way we can do it, is by giving nature rights. That means rivers has rights, forests has rights, mountains has rights, and can be represented in a court of law. And what we're seeing in our collective work globally is that people's movements are rising to say, we don't want the commodification and financialization of Mother Earth and the sky. We don't want the atmosphere for sale. We don't want our sacred earth, water, and air, and force in the marketplace. This is what Sheila was also saying. We don't want to see carbon offset programs or carbon capture, which we've been talking about uh, throughout the last few days here, because these are market mechanisms. These are the way we got into the crisis, is this economic framework. We need to get nature out of the marketplace. These are false solutions to the climate crisis. Instead, we want to see pollution stopped at the source. We want to have Exxon pay at the source, not be able to um, ex continue to extract and then have some forest in, on indigenous people's land in the Amazon be what allows them to have a carbon offset so they can keep, complete, uh, keep polluting. They need to stop polluting. We need to shut them down. We don't need to give them further license to keep polluting. So in essence, we need to find a way to live in reciprocity with nature, which means we have to change. We have to stop consuming so, not, so much. We need to change who we are and how we interact with each other and Mother Earth. And like Mother Earth's immune system, people are really rising to, up in their communities to say yes to rights of nature. Um, Ecuador has rights of nature in their constitution since 2008. Uh, there's all kinds of ordinances in the United States that are um, implementing the rights of nature. So this is not just an idea. This is Rights of nature is actually being implemented. The Ponca Nation has made history as the first tribe in the U.S. to recognize rights of nature into law to protect their territory from fossil fuel extraction. New Zealand Parliament has given the Wanganui River legal standing. The Colombian Supreme Court has recognized rights of the Amazon River ecosystem. Um, it's actually one of the fastest growing movements uh, uh, right now in the environmental space, um, which is really exciting. Um, in the past two years, rights of nature has become law in over 20 countries, uh, with several more under consideration. I'm looking at the time. Um, so I will just leave it at that. What I want to say is that when we look upstream, we see that we need to address our values, worldviews, and ideologies. So for systemic change and long-term solutions, uh, it, it, it is about getting to um, different ways of thinking. As the world prepares for COP28 in Dubai this November and December, we know that solutions exist that can mitigate the worst impacts of the crim climate crisis. And I want you to know that women are leading the way, and I want to get into that right now. Um, globally, women are responsible for the majority of the world's food production. In most global South countries, women produce uh, between 40 and 80 percent of food and are central stewards of seeds and agricultural biodiversity. Uh, one key study that I uh, submitted actually to uh, the Scenarios Forum, which feeds information to the IPCC, just shows that a one unit increase, think about this, a one unit increase, that's all, in a country's score on the Women's Political Empowerment Index is associated with an 11.51% decrease in the country's carbon emissions. That's just one of so many stats I could give you about why women's leadership is key at this point. Actively involving women um, to, uh, to participate in management and decision-making surrounding local forests and disaster planning and responses leads to more successful programs and projects. Electing women politicians in national parliaments leads countries to adopt more stringent climate change policy, which results in lower carbon dioxide emissions. Um, I could name so many <laughs> projects. We we're working with women in the DR Congo where we're, we've been reforesting for eight years now. And as we're growing this new forest, we're protecting 1.6 million acres of old growth forests in the DR Congo. Uh, we have food sovereignty networks 
um, that are in, uh, in the Amazon and uh, the Gulf South of the United States and the DR Congo where basically women are, are moving themselves out of the current structures, growing their own food, growing, uh, caring for their communities, growing their own medicines, saving seeds, and making their solutions on the ground. And a lot of times these things are seen as very, very small localized solutions. But when you add them up, they're bigger than a lot of these corporate top-down structures that actually don't care for people on the ground. So I also want us to think differently about what do solutions look like. Um, gender equity and women's leadership can no longer be an afterthought when drafting climate policy. For decades, climate justice movements have been showing how women's leadership is necessary for climate solutions. And I would just suggest that you go to our website so I don't rattle off a bunch of stats, but I'm telling you, one of the reasons we started the Women's Earth and Climate Action Network is because women are leading in so many areas that it's, it's a really uh, obvious solution, as well as listening to indigenous leadership, which has been guiding us um, and, and trying to direct our movements for, for decades and decades. So yet, all, all this said about women's leadership, out of 110 leaders represented at the last COP, COP27, only seven were women, and they made up less than 34% of the negotiating teams at the UN summit. At COP26, men accounted for 60% of active speakers, um, and spoke for 74% of the time. I think this is a little bit of a problem. So this is why we're really uplifting women's leadership. It's code red for humanity, and we are drawing a red line to say no more sacrifice people and no more sacrifice zones. And I say this because no one, no one, no indigenous people, black, brown, folks cannot be at the end of the line here. This is what I'm talking about when I say climate justice. There can't be sacrificed people and there cannot be sacrificed lands. That means this is how one of the ways we stop extracting is who's getting impacted by that extraction. If you look like me, it doesn't happen in my backyard. So that means that we need to understand this intersectional lens. There has to be a place for this dirty work to go on. And if we, if we really have an environmental justice and climate justice framework and care for frontline communities, there's no place that should be the place where these harms are taking place in people's communities. On every continent, we're also seeing um, this issue of, I'm, I'm gonna close here because I'm running out of time. I, I want to say something very specifically about women land defenders. Um, in a lot of the communities that we work with, whether it's indigenous communities or black or brown communities, I tell you some of the main organizers are women. And the attack on women land defenders is very specific. And it also is often with sexual threats. And so I want us to have a little bit of space to just in our minds really hold in a sacred way, in a special way, on this day of indigenous People's Day and Women's Day combined, um, a, a real acknowledgement of the bravery and courage and beauty of these frontline women who are organizing their communities and understand the water, they understand the land, they understand where their food's coming from, they understand caring for their families. And many of them are under threat. So one of the big things that we're doing at WeCan is looking how do we defend the defenders? And some of that in the United States has to do with the epidemic of missing and murdered indigenous women. And we have programs to work on that because there's a direct link between where these fossil fuel pipelines happen and the threat against the women in those territories. Or if we look to the global south, their global witness has many reports on the killings of land defenders, especially indigenous land defenders, because of their defense of forests. And so there is um, something called the Escazu Agreement, and uh, we're working on a very big campaign. I don't have time to go into it there, but it's a really unique multilateral agreement in the Latin American region, where it's one of the first laws globally where you have environmental laws combined with human rights. And so this is a tool and mechanism that we can use to protect land defenders in the global south. 
So there's a lot of other <laughs> solutions and ideas we can talk about. I can see that my time is up. Um, but I just wanted to thank you for paying attention to this issue, understanding the role of women, and understanding that indigenous peoples and women are a climate solution. And we need to get into a larger framework and understand what are women saying, why are they saying it, what are indigenous people saying, why are they saying it, and slow down and open our ears because there are so many solutions we have, but we absolutely have to take on the institution of patriarchy, colonization, racism, and capitalism, or we won't get to the root causes. And many people in our movements are working actively on this dismantling process while we're also growing incredible work that are solutions that are happening from the ground up that can really address um, what I think is really the people's work. And we need to get a lot of these corporations, the fossil fuel industry, a lot of the power structures that we see at hand out of the way because in a lot of ways, people are doing what needs to happen. Look at all the solutions we've heard all weekend. We need to get a lot of these um, companies and governments out of the way of interfering with the people's work who knew what to do right now. Thank you.